Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. Glad you're here. Let me tell you something. I'm going to give you some excellent news today. I do it each and every day because you are on the side of conservatism. You are on the right side. That's not even meant to be a pun. You are on the side of righteousness. You wake up every single morning with your moral core intact. Now, you violate it because you are failed Christians. You are flawed individuals, but you know you violated it and you don't make excuses. You don't look for rationalizations. You own it and then you move forward and you improve yourself. You make yourselves better. You do this for everything around you. You do this with your children. You do this with your coworkers. You do this with your friends. We build each other up. You know the old saying, there's a psychological experiment that said, you are more than likely to be like 80% of your friends. You have, Or maybe it's like you're 80% likely to be like most of your friends. I don't know what it is, but it's something like that. I'm no shrink. What are you looking at me for? But you get what I'm saying. You are like those you surround yourself with. Denzel Washington said this, whatever you practice, you will get good at. Whatever you do routinely, you will get good at. And you know what you do routinely? You get up, you show up, and you follow up. You go to work, you do your job, you come home, you continue to do your job, raising your kids and being good people in the community. You're not out robbing people. You're not out looking for uh, the free handouts. You're not out doing all the bad things. Do we do bad things? Yes, we do. But let me tell you, the people who get up in the morning looking for an angle, looking for a way out, looking for a way to take advantage of somebody are firmly on the left. Remember when Michelle Obama pointed over across the aisle at all those white men over there? Let me tell you something. Metaphorically, that is a conservative movement. I'm not saying we're all white men because I'm certainly not a white man and I don't want to be. But she metaphorically was pointing at you because let me tell you something. White men are not as bad as the left want to make us out to not me, but make the white men to be out to be. You know what I'm saying? I know there are people like Kevin, you just want to be a white guy. I don't care. I don't care anything about being a white man. What I'm telling you is the metaphor of pointing over on the right and saying, look at those bad people represented by white men. I have no problem being represented by white men. You know, I have a problem being represented by I have a problem being represented by the left who will tell you that women are amazing when women hate men. These feminists over there don't like men. They don't like their men. They've they've effectively dehumanized it certainly uh, uh, or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They've taken the manhood out of their men. What else has the left done? So they've made vile women. They've made vile special interest groups like blacks and the Latinos. And they say, hey, go over there and hate those people for no reason. Go hate the people that can do you the most good. And who, by the way, always do you the most good. Go hate them. Find a reason to hate them. So that's what they do. They wake up in the morning and then they tell them, hey, you know what? They got something. You need it. They got it. Why do you need to work for it? Just get it from them. And if they don't want to give it up, you vote for us and we'll get it for you. For you, We'll do it for you. We'll do the dirty work. That's who they represent. They are the most anti-God, anti-American, anti-military, anti-capitalist, anti-free market. Why? Because all of that represents the rugged individualism that this country made. The thing that made us amazing was our rugged individualism. And you know what makes rugged individualism? When you got to do something on your own. When you have to come over from across the, the, the ocean to a new land and you got to figure out what you can eat, where you can live. You got hostile people that go, hey, we were here first. You got places you don't know what crops can grow. You don't know what berries to eat. You don't know the indigenous wildlife, the terrain and all the different things. But you learn it. And you know what we did? America evolved. They call it the frontier spirit. We evolved. And that frontier spirit is in the DNA of every single one of us. And the only problem is it's weakening little by little. Now, we've been able to keep it together because we've had a hearty, you know, rural America that the left hates, by the way. They can't stand it. They don't want young kids to go out into rural America and see clean air and see rivers running and watch how nature works. 
so that these kids can see that the food that's in the grocery store doesn't get there by magic. It gets there because there are people out there toiling the soil. There are people out there in the as in the animal husbandry business who make a living by providing food to you. They, they will find out how a belt is made, how blue jeans are made, that it grows from a cotton, a product like cotton, or that a, a cow can give its hide and then somebody will turn that hide into something else useful. And that the frontier spirit meant don't waste anything. That's what they'd see. But the left wants you to believe they're the, the, the guys that are the good stewards of the na- of the world. They don't waste anything. They, they recycle. Well, good for them. You ever watch the the actual frontier people? Go look at the, the one, some of these Alaskan shows and see what they do when they kill an animal. What goes to waste? Hardly anything. So you woke up this morning on the right side, folks, and you listen to the right program, because let me tell you something. I absolutely adore you. I adore that spirit that says, you know what, Kevin, if you ever need me, you just call, baby. You guys tell me this all to Kevin. If you're ever in Atlanta, I'll buy you lunch. I'll buy you dinner. Let's have a drink together. Kevin, if you happen to be in, you know, Florida, I was going to say plantation, Florida, but that would have just been too, that would have been too much for liberals to handle. But if you're ever here, come by and see me. If I'm in town, come by. I was with Travis Tritt the other day, Travis Tritt, country and Western singer. He's swinging through, uh, going to a concert in, um, California somewhere. I want to say Redmond. I don't know where it was, but Rosemont or something. And he sends me a tweet. Kev, I'm going to be in town. You know, you want to get together? Yes. Got together with Travis Tritt. He brings me his latest CDs and the whole deal. Uh, I'm going to get together with him when I'm in Atlanta. That's the spirit of America. And you know what he said? He said, Kev, if you get to Atlanta, when you get there, he goes, you know, you can stay at the house. Wife, the kids, the whole deal. Uh, He's talking about his wife and kids. Stay at the house. You, you you know my mi casa su casa okay <laughs> and it was just a it's an amazing thing to reach out to these folks we communicate with each other and thank goodness we have social media that allowed for that and you know what's really interesting about Travis coming to town I had just gotten off Twitter lockdown <laughs> so I finally got to I, well I probably could have seen it but I saw it I hadn't been checking Twitter for a week because I was on a week of lockdown because I taunted Hillary Clinton I dare taunt Hillary Anyway, folks, today we got a ton. I'm telling you, a ton of stuff to talk about. It'll blow your mind. A connection to Uranium One and the farce, the lies of Hillary Clinton and that clan. They're going down over this. I know you don't believe it, but they will. And we got a ton more besides that. You're listening to Kevin Jackson. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. Kevin J. 
Jackson Radio Show. What's up, everybody? Kevin Jackson here. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. Let me tell you something. There, soon, soon, very soon, it will no longer be fashionable to be anti-conservative, to be anti-American, or to be anti-Trump. Hang in there. That day is coming, and it's coming sooner than you think. What's happening right now with everything that Donald Trump's been doing fighting all of these uh, these ghosts of Russia and the racism calls of the NFL and he didn't do this with this uh, this girl that this uh, uh, gold star wife or whatever let me tell you something it's going away let's think about what happened with this gold star wife for just a second Donald Trump's going to call they set this stuff up in advance the president's going to call you she being anti-Trump the gold star wife calls her representative and they try to set something up to say that Donald Trump disrespected her. Now, nobody truly believes it. Even the left, they don't believe it. They know that's a lie, but they got to promote the narrative that Donald Trump's going after this ghost star wife. And I've already jokingly said, sure, because Donald Trump hates the military. He never does anything for him. He cut their budget. He never would ever collect any money on their behalf. And of course, all of that was nonsense because he's done all the things that I said that he didn't do. That's the irony of it, right? <laughs> Let's all keep up here. So they try to, con- you know, connive together to construct the story that says Donald Trump disrespected this woman, something he would never do. And, and to somebody else's point, they were like, well, you know, Donald Trump knows he's talking to a black lady. Donald Trump didn't care if he's talking to a black person, a white person or whatever. He wasn't going to disrespect the service of that young man who died. End of story. I, the Democrats are so desperate now. They're trying to sell lies that people just go, that didn't happen. Now, they may rile up a few people, but here's the problem. They're not riling up anybody and they're searching for everything and everything they search for turns out to be wrong. It turns out to be a strategically wrong move for two reasons. One, it's idiotic for them to try this stuff. They should just quit. And two, Trump is a master at trumping them. Thus the name. (laughs) So they should quit this. And you would think that in the spirit of cooperation and making this country better, they would do it. Now, that's never going to happen. I want to just be very clear. If you are out there and you're like, Kevin, eventually they're going to come on board. They're not going to get on board. But what's going to happen is the moderates, the people that call themselves moderates, they are leaving the Democrat Party in droves. The Democrat Party is in triage. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but I want to give you the backdrop. Part of the reason is Hillary Clinton, they know, is a liar. The every single day this woman appears in public, it doesn't matter what she's doing. She's proven to be a liar. We'll get into that in just a second because that this has to do with Uranium One. All right. So I want to talk about that. I want to explain to you how the Democrats are in such bad shape but they're pretending that everything's okay. Nancy Pelosi just recently said, no, 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 we're in good shape. Maybe we'll get to that too today. But I want to start with this. The Democrats can't raise money. I don't know if you got, you probably don't because this isn't one of the mainstream type things you keep up with, but the Democrats can't raise money. And here's what, why they can't. Wherever you find Democrats in concentration, you find pestilence in its midst look at the cities run by Democrats and what do you have you have every problem every uh, ill of society is exponentially exposed I mean if if you want to see violence of any type I'm talking about the most violent crimes whether it's murder whether it's rape whether it's robbery whether it's you know, co- collusion or, or corruption of business, whatever, go to a big city and look who's in charge, the mayor, the city council, police chiefs, etc. And at every level of it is the biggest cancer you could possibly have on the body politic everywhere. 
Do we really need another article that's top 10? No, top 50? No, top 100 worst places to live? Because there will not be a Republican city among them unless a Democrat wrote the article. Because if you look at crime rate, you know, unemployment, <laughs> uh, teenage pregnancy, uh, school dropout, whatever, you look wherever the Democrats amass, that's where it'll be. And then take go inside of that city, find the conservative enclave, the people who think like you and you and I, or you and me, is it like you and me? Yeah. Whatever. Uh, my English teacher, she just passed away, so she won't hear this. But you go look at those folks. Look where they live and you will find the only bright spots in that city. Now, there'll be people who say, well, Kevin, there's some some hipsters that really gentrified an area, whatever. Uh, OK, fine. If you want to believe that that area has been regentrified because of hipsters, fine. I'm telling you, the people where you're going to find the that are the, the salt of the earth, that that are the stable part of that community that are generating the tax base and on and on that enclave will be conservatives and it'll be them, them hiding out. They effectively will be gated or, you know, cornered off from where everything else and they can kind of live in their bubble. That's how it is in these cities. The investment in leftism folks has failed. The left know this trillions of dollars spent on meaningless programs that have made this country more divided than ever. And if Donald Trump's election showcased anything, he showcased just how bad things are on the left. Now, you could take that as, oh, Kevin, he couldn't have won if things had been good. Okay, I agree. If if Barack Obama, excuse me, if Barack Obama had been a uh, amazing president, no, Donald Trump wouldn't have won. If Hillary Clinton had been an amazing candidate, Donald Trump wouldn't have won. If the Democrats in any of these major cities, they care. Hillary won a popular vote. Yes, she won the popular vote in all these urban enclaves because, you know, they that's that's all they know. But the fact is, if they if she had done as well, if they if everybody in, in the Democrats had been doing as well as they said they'd done, would Donald Trump have won these uh, these counties in Ohio? And in these counties in Pennsylvania and these counties in Michigan that supposedly were always going to go for the for the Democrats that Barack Obama carried. The answer is no. So these people divided the country. They threw the gauntlet down. White men, middle class men, just to heck with you. We're going to we're going to sell out to the special interest. You guys that are getting up, as I mentioned in the earlier part of the broadcast, going to work, not caring about race and in class, you know, you you are so not into that stuff because rightfully so America's made that transition and the Democrats will never let you forget what your ancestors did. And this election cycle, you finally got fed up. And the Democrats are suffering mightily. I gotta take a short break, but I'm gonna give you the numbers when we come back. The Democrats can't fundraise. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. We're talking about Democrats' inability to fundraise. (laughs) And it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. As I said... Go to a Democrat city. Tell me why you would want to donate money to them. Show me what they've built that you go, oh my gosh, you know, look at what, when we put money into them, here's what we get. You get nothing but, I mean, you could not, you're investing in evil. I'll just put it that way. You're investing in evil. Put that money to work with, and I'm not telling you Republicans are good because they're a bunch of rhinos over there too. But if you put that money to work in conservative causes, you'll get good results. Things like what the church does. Look at charities run by conservatives. I'll tell you, from a personal perspective, <laughs> running charities, having run three pretty you know decent sized ones, I will tell you, I've put more money into our charitable work 
then I, we know, first of all, we've never made a nickel. We've never taken a nickel out of the charities, not one. And then we go out and find funding for it and get people like, you know, Anheuser-Busch has supported me uh, back before they got bought by uh, the other guys. And um, we had liquor distributors that would do our events. The Cardinals, when I wasn't living in St. Louis, uh, they were just amazing. Uh, we used the, the Redbird Club. Uh, we had the Champions Club where we featured the, the stuff. Point is, didn't take a nickel. But the orchestration and the amount of time it took for my organization cost us tens of thousands of dollars over the past 10 years. Easily. Easily. Never taken a nickel. Put in a lot of time and effort. I've been... I've had more, you know, 30 person committees to put these things together. And, and it took a lot of effort by a lot of good quality people, people like you to make this happen. So that's how we did it. But when the Democrats do things, when they fundraise, it's all selfishly motivated. It's to put a group together that's going to go get a bunch of fake signatures so they can act like they got the right voter rolls. And then you end up with 130 percent of voter registrations for people. They're registering illegals. They don't care. You've seen all the undercover videos. I don't have to talk to you about it. But let me tell you something. It's catching up with them. All of this is happening, guys, for a reason. I want you to think about what's going on in this country because of the election of Donald Trump. I'm not saying that he's driving it. I quite frankly believe it's a higher thing. It's it's a God thing that Donald Trump, during the time of Trump, you get the exposure of Weinstein. You get this Uranium One deal. You get Barack Obama, who's about to be exposed for the biggest fraud. Uh, the I mean, we got played like you wouldn't believe in this country by this man. And the Democrats know this. They know that when the, the, when the shoe, the anvil falls on Barack Obama, There goes their party. They're hanging on, man, like a hair on a biscuit because they're going, we've got to protect this man. We've got to rally the troops. But it doesn't matter because their troops are abandoning them. Democrats may be finally receiving the message. They are the party of destruction. And their finances suffer mightily under under the realization of just how destructive their party has been. The DNC can't attract donors. They're having a tough time encouraging their existing donors to contribute because they don't know the the donors are going to contribute to what? What do you represent, DNC? Tell us what you are. You've got a a, a disgraced DNC chairman, chairwoman, D- Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who's embroiled in controversy with this Awan brothers and this IT scandal. Then she was replaced by Donna Brazil, who cheated. Look, if you're a Democrat and you say, look, it's OK that Donna Brazil fed Hillary Clinton the, the questions for the DNC. And, that, and by the way, that's the most benign thing she did. If if somebody fed Trump that and he took it, we as conservatives would be outraged at both of them. We'd be outraged because if you can't win on ideas and and come up with the responses at the time of the of the questioning and not be prepared in advance. You've already prepared in advance. That's the deal. But the Democrats, that's what they did. And and they have no bones about it. Well, that's what, if that's what it took for Hillary to win, then that's what we need to do. Really? So you're willing to cheat the republic because Hillary couldn't come up with an answer on the fly. What the Democrats were saying when the, by feeding Hillary these debate questions is she doesn't have the ability to think on her feet because she has no core. She doesn't know what she stands for. But the Democrats don't see it that way. They see it as we have to win at all costs. Even if Hillary doesn't know the answers, we'll get her the right answers. We will have the speechwriters have the perfect response. What is the perfect response? Somebody tell me what the perfect response is. If it isn't in your belly, a fire burning in your belly, you don't have the perfect response. People say to me, Kevin, how do you get on TV and say all this? I say the stuff that that I mean. That's what I say. Anyway, uh, they said this. Donors, small and large, are so over the party. This is Jane Klebe, chair of the Nebraska Party, told Politico, commenting on the failure of the DNC chairman, Tom Perez, to refocus the party. Refocus to what? Refocus to racism. 
refocus to sexism, refocus to accusing everybody around you of problems that you create. What are you refocusing to? Look, this, this is so telling when the DNC and the people within the party are going, you know what? What do we do? So they say, so donors, though donors continue to support individual candidates and causes, the DNC's fundraising troubles may imperil the party strategy for the 2018 elections. Now, guys, I've already told you what's going to happen in the 2018 elections. Republicans are going to sweep. They're going to gain seats in the House. They're going to gain seats in the Senate. And don't be surprised if Donald Trump in the next year puts in two judges. Don't be shocked by any of that. And it isn't me being, you know, Jim Carville, all, you know, James Carville, all, you know, well, now that we got Obama and that, the Republicans ain't going to win it for 100 years. It isn't that. I'm not even thinking. There's no, it isn't like I'm, I'm some, oh, look at what we did with Donald Trump. Not at all. I'm just looking at the thing objectively and saying, if you've got Donald Trump who got ushered in, in the most unlikely of circumstances with every, I mean, you can't stack the deck any more than against a, a candidate than, than they did with Trump. So you have him winning and then you have him performing and you think somebody's going to beat him. Bring on Beyonce. Bring who else is going to run? They said, uh, Michelle Obama, who uh, somebody else, who was it? We were talking about the other day. Anyway, these people that are going to run, bring it on. Oh, Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban, really? You think you're going to go from Shark Tank to president? Bring it on, Mark Cuban. (laughs) People are crazy. They said this. Everybody thinks some magic three-page document and some magic tagline is going to turn everything around to us, Cleve said. But this is very typical work. The article says, though donors continue to support these individual candidates, the, the party itself is struggling. And here are the numbers. The party raised about four million in September compared to the Republican National Committee's haul of ten million in the same period. So the Republicans raised two point five more, two hundred and fifty percent more money than the Democrats. But it gets worse. Because not only did the Republicans outraise the Democrats two point five to one, but the Republicans have six times the cash on hand. Now, we're talking about a long way before, folks. Don't get excited about these numbers, but these are the numbers. Currently, the Republicans have $44 million in the, of cash on hand. The Democrats have seven. That's it. But it gets even worse. When the DNC was going to replace Donna Brazil, cheat, they... The two biggest guys that were fighting it out were Keith Ellison and Tom Perez and Tom Perez won. Now, Tom Perez is a radical leftist, you know, very Latino. You know, he wants to, you know, I mean, he's he's everything that we are not in terms of he, he wants open borders, the whole thing. Keith Ellison hates Jews. He's a, a Muslim. And I don't know why he doesn't just change his name to, you know, Mohammed Rafa or whatever. But he calls himself Keith, Keith Ellison still. And. He's in, you know, he's in broil and controversy. Now, these are the two guys, a heavy Latino dude, a, a ethnocentric, racist black dude who hates Jews. And that's who ultimately Tom Perez won. And in order to placate Ellison, who he doesn't really like, he brings Ellison in as his uh, co-chair, you know, not co-chair, but, you know, vice chair. So these are the two running the party. And now the Democrats are going, they can't seem to attract any voters. Well, I wonder why. They said uh, uh, Perez outlined a new direction to win back the thousand seats that they lost. How are you going to do that? They had the best possible thing they could ever have in Barack Obama, and they lost 1,030 or 1,080 seats for special elections, probably going to lose another governorship. And what's Trump doing? Trump's doing what Trump does. He's winning, baby. He's a rock star. He's turning the economy around, and we'll get to this in a second. I got to stop for just a second, but I'm going to come back to this. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. 
My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. KJRadio.com, 24-7, on demand, whenever you want this show. You want to listen live, go to KJRadio.com, click the button, and you got us whenever we're on at that time. Uh, hopefully you will. And hopefully you'll share with what you, you know, whatever you learn. If you learn something, share it with others. Uh, I, I tell people, we try to make this a humor-based show, but with the idea that underlying the humor is the serious nature of what we're dealing with. So hopefully you get that. And, and to be honest with you, I just can't take politics that seriously because if you do, you, it'll drive you crazy. It will general genuinely drive you crazy. Before we get back to uh, talking about what the, uh, the Democrats are doing, I want to bring up uh, Maxine Waters veiled threat against the president and I want to ask yourself how things would be if the Obama were getting the level of threats by I'm talking politicians saying things like, well, I ought to go there and uh, and do him in. And they say it just so lackadaisically. What would the media reaction be if people were threatening in different forms, like talking to the college or university about doing the president in now, look, we've seen the fallout of this with the Kathy Griffins and, George Lopez, all these D listers that are on their way out there. And I, as I said, when I opened a program, I said, or maybe we did in the second segment, but I said, there's going to come a time where people are no, no longer going to be talking smack against Donald Trump, at least not to the degree that they are now. It will suddenly be less in vogue to do that. Comedians won't be able to do it. I was listening to Trevor Noah talk about all the evidence he has of Trump's racism. This is a kid that comes from Australia, inherits a TV program, makes millions of dollars, bashes the country and the president, and and essentially doesn't understand what makes America great. The fact that he could do all of that is pretty doggone amazing. He couldn't fill a thimble with what he knows about America, culturally. He's been here two years. He thinks he knows our country. But you know, going back to Maxine Waters, how insignificant must you be? When you make a threat against the president and the Secret Service goes, that old crazy witch, <laughs> they don't even, they probably didn't even investigate. They probably went, who cares? She's a member of the Congressional Black Circus. Oh, y'all talking about that circus clown? <laughs> yeah, she, she's always making threats. <laughs> you know, they don't even care. You're insignificant. Just amazing. And black folks vote these clowns in day in and day out. They don't seem to care. But anyway, I want to go back to Tom Perez, leader of the DNC. They can't earn, you know, raise any money. They raised four million dollars in September. The Republicans raised ten million. By the way, that's those aren't land speed records by any means. Donald Trump could raise ten million dollars in a week. He could, if Donald Trump said, "Look, we're going to build up the campaign. We're going to already start doing blankety blank, and I need you to fund it." I don't even know what the number would be if that man called out and said, we're going to start doing this, running our 2020 campaign. Here's where we're going to start. Uh, Cause people, they want to donate to support this dude. He changed all the rules in that regard. So the money that is going to the RNC is nothing in comparison to Trump himself is what I'm getting at. You get, you see the D the DNC and, 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 and let me put it a different way. 
Who does the the left have that they can go out and say, we need to raise $50 million by this amount of time and somebody do it? If you want to tell me Barack Obama still has that juice, I'll tell you, he doesn't. He doesn't have it. So Barack Obama loses all the seats. He's up there right now running in uh, Virginia, trying to help the Virginia governor's race. And I'm going to make a prediction that the next governor of Virginia will be a Republican. (laughs) Because... If you have Obama running for you, you're in big trouble. In fact, there was a Senate candidate who was asked point blank, will you use Hillary Clinton in your campaign? And he was it was painstaking for him not to answer no, but to be saying no. If you get a chance to see the interview, it's absolutely pretty funny because he's like, well, you know, uh, and the guy, look, it's a pretty simple question. Are you going to use Hillary Clinton? And well, you know, the former secretary of state and, and but he won't say no, but he certainly isn't going to say yes. OK. It's one of those. It's tortured, I think, is what the the word I would use. It was a tortured interview. So the Democrats, they rebrand. I've ridiculed them about it. It was better this, better that, better this. And people thought it was like a Papa John's pizza commercial. But it's beyond ridicule because people in their party who probably, I mean, right or wrong, I think wrongly, want to get something out of it, want to feel like they're a part of something, they are finding out there is no message. They rebranded. They tried the strategy of of giving the president his agenda in hopes of taking credit. But Twitter ruined that for him. Their first strategy was we will oppose him across the board. We're just going to oppose the president. That'll do it. Then Pelosi and, and Schumer went, you know what? That's not working. He's too good. <laughs> He's just too good. So they had to change and said, let's agree with them on a few things and then we'll co-opt them. And then Trump's tweeting, yeah, they think they're going to co-opt me, but it's my deal. It's not theirs. I'm good. It's huge. I'm going to make it better. You know. And they're going, what do we do to this guy? So in a move that shows that Democrats aren't complete morons, donors, top Democrats say, we've got a lack of confidence in Perez and deputy DNC chair. That's what Keith Ellison's role is. Um, and, and two radicals, you couldn't pick two worse candidates. I swear, if, if I were trying to ruin the Democrat Party, I'd say, let's see. Hmm. Let's make Tom Perez the chair and Keith Ellison his deputy. <laughs> I mean, and the Democrats, uh, you know what they're mad? They're, they're saying these two can't motivate the party or the masses to come over. How are you going to get an ethnocentric racist Hispanic and an ethnocentric racist black to motivate the party. First of all, they don't even like each other. Okay. Then you go out and you say, Hey, uh, middle, uh, middle America, white guys, uh, we want you back. Said the two ethnocentric racist non-whites. Hey, white guys, uh, we know you abandoned us during, during the 2016 elections, but we could sure use your help. And wonder why they aren't going to give it to you. They said this. This is what a uh, Tina Potlowski, who's the Washington state chairwoman. I mean, you don't get much more left than the Washington state chairwoman. But she says, uh, if you look at what Tom is trying to do in Keith, it really is a turnaround of the whole organization. See, the Democrats believe that they've been this big 10 organization and they're saying these guys can't attract anybody because they're so pointed at their thing. Keith Ellison, I'm not kidding you. If you listen to this guy talk, he hates the Jews. He hates white people. He hates conservatives. He hates Christians. Okay. So what does that leave you to go after? Guatemalan midgets is all I can think of. So the Democrats have no message. And it's so difficult to be anti-Trump on everything when, in fact, what the man does makes sense. And see the difference. And this is why I talk about the leadership difference, the void we've had with Obama. Trump says we're going to build a wall. People get mad. We're going to build a wall. This is terrible. This is, you know, know, xenophobic. And you don't want Mexicans. He hates Mexicans and all. And Trump goes, no, no, it has to do with the economy, has to do with. The the fact that these people are coming over, taking jobs, they're killing people. We've got gangs, we've got drugs, and and people are so. Whoa, wait a minute! I didn't realize all that. 
Maybe we do need to build a wall. So he's he and I'll, I will get to his wall in, later in the broadcast, but he's got the wall going up and these people don't know what to do because everything Trump does. Eventually, it sort of leaches into the body politic and people start going, yeah, you know, trade. We do need to look at trade. We do need to look at these Muslims coming in and killing people. You know, when a Democrat donor is looking at their crystal balls, they don't see the Democratic Party. They see Donald Trump revitalizing all aspects of America, including the way the younger generation thinks about this country. No longer, folks, is pessimism the word of the era. Pessimism has been replaced by optimism. And the Democrats have no ideas. They paint anybody who dare not agree with them as racist, and they have so many overworked words. I talked about them the other day. Racist, homophobic, misogynist, whatever. Look, call us what you want. But we're, we're sick of it. So what do Democrats do to stem the tide of Trumpism? They can't do anything. They're the same old, same old. They they throw a bunch of, you know, hey, let's do another fundraiser at Martha's Vineyard. Well, you know what? I've been if there are people out there, donors going, how many times do you want me to go to Martha's Vineyard? You've been there, done that. This one lady, uh, a, a dude, his name is John Morgan, a longtime donor. He said, I've had enough dinners. He goes, I need more. I'm not really interested. I'm not going to let, you know, I want to get new blood. I can't get motivated with these guys. That's their problem. He won't stop until he's the top rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. What's up, everybody? Kevin Jackson here. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. 1.5 million Americans dropped off the food stamp rolls. Are you aware of this? KJRadio.com is where you can find out more about us on demand anytime, 24-7. Check us out. If you want to call the program, 844-551-8255. 1.5 Americans dropped off food stamp rolls since Donald Trump took office January of 2017 this is according to the US Department of Agriculture USDA statistics on food stamp enrollment while Barack Obama added 16 million people to the food stamp rolls Donald Trump is taking them off he's not kicking them off he's jobbing them off the snap program participation dropped to 41 million in change as of July of 2017, the most recent data available, that's a drop from 42,691,000 and change as of January when the president took office. A decrease of 3.48% or 1,487,642 people since President Donald Trump became the norm. From May to July alone, nearly 400,000 Americans got off food stamps, and the trend shows that the enrollment has been consistently falling every month of the Trump presidency. Folks out there, conservatives, I give you winning. I want you to ask yourself what we'd be ta- we would be talking about if Hillary Clinton were the president right now. Would we be talking about falling food stamps? Would we be talking about the Uranium One Russia story? What would they be covering up? Who knows? Thankfully, we don't have to ask ourselves that. But what we can look at now is the data. And the data is Donald Trump's program, his economy, has made its its rock star status. I want you to consider this number. We've talked about it before. When Barack Obama took office, in his first, what I think it was the first year or first few months, whatever it was, he lost four million jobs. In Barack, in a Donald Trump's first, maybe it was the first ninety days, but they he's gained a million jobs. I think his first six months. First six months, Obama loses four million jobs. First six months for Trump, he gains a million jobs. Now the delta of that is five million, and. It just goes to show you the level of confidence, the le- what happens when you put the right person in charge. 
while Barack Obama came in and he talked about regulating industry out of business. He told you he was going to crater the coal industry and he did it. And Donald Trump said, I'm bringing it back. And he did it. Barack Obama told you manufacturing is going to move offshore and there's nothing you can do about it. And Donald Trump says, I'll keep manufacturing here and I'll stop people that were looking to move offshore from moving. And then I'm going to bring some of it back. And he's doing it. And you wonder, look, how many indicators do you need? You've got unemployment at its lowest point, And I think the last thing I saw was 29 years. And this is legit. These are good jobs. You've got consumer confidence at an all-time high. I told you guys the other day, it's going to be the best Christmas season we've had in a decade. You've got businesses that are reinvesting in America because of this president. And we can talk about all these other things, but then I want to add to it. You know, we got the stock market. I know. Y'all don't have to tell me what I'm talking. I know what I'm doing. This is my show. This is my joint. Anyway, so you've got all these other things. And, and producers talking in your ear. But now you have another factor. You have people who have probably wanted to get off food stamps. And by the way, they're not getting off food stamps so they can go get on disability, which is what people did in the Obama era. They're getting off food stamps because they have jobs. And they have jobs, good jobs. We're not talking about menial jobs. They have jobs that are going to lead to careers that they can invest in. And they, they find an exuberance. These people are going to finally get to go out and not be at the behest of the taxpayer and feel guilty about spending money. Because I'm going to tell you something. If I was on food stamps, even if it, you know it's my own money that I'm getting back in terms of welfare. But if I'm at the welfare of the nation, I'm not going to buy a bunch of Christmas stuff. I'm not going to go buy a bunch of extra stuff. I'm not going to the movies. I'm not doing the little extra things because I feel bad. I, and the other thing is, I don't know what I'm going to need that money for. But you're going to watch people. Are, I hope they don't go to the movies. But whatever they do, they're going to spend their money and have a little bit of extra fun that they normally wouldn't have. And I can tell you a little personal story. I've done that a couple times in the last three months. I've actually gone out and done something I might not otherwise do under Obama because I had to watch my duckies a little closer. Let me give you the numbers. January to February, 408, almost 409,000 people moved off of food stamps. Then from February to March, 95,000. March to April, 521,000. April to May, 176,000. May to June, 178,000. June to July, 236. And you're going to watch these numbers continue to grow. I want you to understand this, folks. From month to month, the smallest number of people that have moved off of food stamps has been 95,000. The largest number of people who moved off has been 521,000. Now, so let's just use an average number and say uh, 150,000. 150,000 people a month are coming off of food stamps off the program have you heard the media applauding donald trump and saying hey congratulations you're 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 creating an economy to where people no longer have to be at the behest of the taxpayers and can now go be self-sufficient think about what that means when you've got off of food stamps and you've gone to get a job you get up in the morning put on your shirt put on your uniform whatever you put on and you got to go out there and go to work and you come home and the kids are like daddy daddy or mommy mommy and you're like yeah dad had a great job at work today son or daughter or insert pronoun that you know the gays want whatever you now feel good about yourself have they have we do we test for that <laughs> Do we ever, I know there's a, like a consumer, uh, you know, like how happy are you index? We got, we got indexes for everything. One final point before the break, food stamp enrollment is down in 42 out of the 50 States, according to the USDA data. That's impressive. Now we got to work on those other eight States. We'll be back in just a bit, folks. Keep it here. Listen to the Kevin Jackson. This is the Kevin Jackson radio show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. 
My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. East to San Diego, between two existing border fences, mock-ups of President Trump's proposed border walls are coming together. What are we looking at? There are a total of eight prototypes, four of which are constructed out of concrete, and then four that are constructed out of alternate material. These are pretty tall. They are, 18 to 30 feet tall. The Trump administration made that height and the construction materials a requirement. That at a time when apprehensions along the border are already on track to be as low as ever without Trump's wall. Will this lower the numbers even further? It's hard to gauge. There's always going to be some form of crime or, in this case, illegal migration. Can we do our job better? Absolutely. And I think that these walls are going to contribute towards that. The full wall isn't funded. Only these samples built by contractors. But if President Trump can somehow convince Mexico or Congress to pay... The wall won't be as long as the one candidate Trump proposed. So currently we have just under uh, 700 miles of of fencing along the border. Uh, We don't have any intentions of fencing off the entire southwest border. It's not necessary. So what happens now? Does the president come out here and literally say, "Okay, I like that one? We're going to test it for breachability, for the subterranean aspect. Can we dig under it? Can we cut through it? Can we scale over it? What happened? The people are crossing. Almost on cue, a group of asylum seekers, migrants not from Mexico, jumped over the existing fence to turn themselves in to border agents on horseback. It's like a small group of three people just jumped over in the middle of the day. Girl there with a pink backpack. Can you explain to me what's going on? This is a reality of everyday border enforcement. The United States is still the draw, the ultimate draw for people that have dire situations where they're at. We're going to continue to witness this. It plays out on a regular basis for us. And it did just here, just now. Just now, yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson. So, the eight experimental prototypical border walls. And I I love that the the, uh, reporter says, well, these are the only, this is the only part that's been funded. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. Donald Trump is going to build a border wall. Period. And what's funny, people were, is he really going to build this wall? Remember during the campaign, is he really going to build a wall? Is that just metaphorical? Is he talking about it? Is Mexico going to really pay for it? Who's going to really pay for it? And you know what? Mexico's already started to pay for it. You guys don't even realize that. Mexico has already started to pay for this wall. I don't know what our trade deficit is with Mexico, but it's shrinking. It's absolutely shrinking. And you can bet that Tillerson knows exactly how much money we spend in Mexico. And he's gone over there and he's look guys, I, I understand the politics of this. I, I can hear him with the country accent. 
I can understand the politics of this. I mean, you guys can't, you, you, you can't lose face over it. We understand. But the fact of the matter is, is we have a $56 billion trade deficit. And you have a lot of people that are sending money back over that we can easily track. So if we look at your economy and we pull $56 billion out, and then we pull that additional $20 billion out that you're getting from your expatriates. Well, let's just say this. Your economy is going to be built on drugs and drugs. So you will be paying for the wall one way or another. Now, the only question is, how do we save face so that you don't look bad? But the president doesn't look bad either. <laughs> I mean, that's the conversation is to be had with Mexico because there is no negotiation room. What are you going to do? You're going to threaten to cut off what? <laughs> don't even get started donald trump will bring back businesses into this country with a quickness see let me explain folks we have these these part of the north american free trade agreement we've got this obviously ability to, to ship products from mexico without tariffs and things like this and we've also built these these manufacturing facilities across the border in towns like juarez and uh uh I mean, just many, many of them, quite frankly, you know, what, what, what are some of the other ones? Uh, I can think of Juarez and maybe Matamoros and places like that. So they're called maquiladores, these plants. And they're part of this the agreement. And Americans cross the border into Mexico to go work at these plants, mostly in supervisory modes and, you know, holding the interests of the, the American corporation. And then Mexicans are employed in droves and these are the best jobs in Mexico because unlike the other jobs in Mexico these guys have to follow many of the American guidelines now they get some benefit of the Mexican uh, economy so you're not paying the exorbitant wages that you would pay in America but you're paying very good wages for Mexicans so they love these jobs and it's a big part of the economy as I said There's a $56 billion trade deficit between the United States and Mexico. So we have a huge advantage. Now, the question is, could you move those facilities back across the border, employ Americans, or even move them over and say, we'll let Mexicans have work visas to come work in America and go back into Mexico. You could cut our deficit, our trade deficit in half by just doing that. We did that as a favor to our south of the border neighbors doing this North America free trade agreement. Now, if you want to run a $56 billion deficit, that's okay. As long as you're getting something for it, we run a $367 billion deficit with China. Now the question is, what do we get for it? So far, we've got not very much under Obama. We've watched that deficit grow as we bring in junk Chinese products, but we haven't balanced that trade deficit out it at all and so donald trump says i'll tell you what we'll start working on this north korean thing we'll see how that goes and yada 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 but he will address that as well here's what you can bet the trade deficit with mexico will shrink in direct proportion to the wall if not more donald trump is not going to spend one dollar of tax american taxpayer money that isn't already accounted for in somewhere else. Now, you may say, well, Kevin, that's not technically Mexico paying for it. Sure it is. If you've been enjoying $56 billion annually from us, and suddenly you're only enjoying $20 billion annually, that's a trade-off. And the thing is, is once that wall is built, then Mexico's really going to have to step up to the table because now they got all these people coming back over. (laughs) <laughs> they're really in a major quandary now because they got people that have gone back because there's no opportunity in America and the jobs are going to be moving back to America. So what do they do? They got to build an economy. Now, I think Trump's going to help them build an economy. President Trump will say, let's let's work on this together. But uh, here's what, I, what I'm going to make a bet on. I don't I can't remember. I, I remember covering Eaton Corporation and some you know big manufacturers. Whirlpool, you know, people like that manufacturing in Mexico. Many of those companies, well, quite a few will come back to America and start manufacturing here. That's what I predict. I don't know which ones. I don't know when it will occur, but you're going to watch. These things will all coincide together. And then 
Tillerson will go over. He'll have meetings with Mexico and say, let's look at visas. Let's look at legalized immigration, worker permits and things like this to keep these jobs going. But Donald Trump is going to prove to Mexico how big our economy is and how big of an impact we have. And he wants to measure it from our side, not from their side. Because see, measuring from it from our side says we are allowing X amount of dollars to go back into your economy, but you're also building part of that into our economy. Many more of those jobs will come to Americans as well. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. I promise we have a ton to talk about, but there's some things that that I, I want to get to that I think are important in a strange kind of way, and I'm going to try to weave it in such a way that you understand the importance and why I've decided to cover it. But there was a woman who wrote an article about powerful women and their, how to deal with Weinstein, and it was published in the Atlantic. And her name is Britt Marling. And she explains her history with Harvey Weinstein. And there were so many things that came out of this that I said, I got to cover this. So here's what she says. When the Harvey Weinstein story broke, I thought of something my mother told me when I was a little girl. She said, to be a free woman, you have to be financially independent. She wasn't wrong. And it's funny because I've had that. I'm, I'm not reading it anymore. I had that same discussion with my sisters. I've had that same discussion with uh, friends of mine who are on the dating scene. I say to them all the time, I go, look, you're wasting your time dating. If you're like, get a divorce, you're struggling and then you meet some guy and he buys you dinner and he, you know, gets a kid some diapers or something here and there. And you think, oh, my God, he's going to save my life. He's, he's amazing. And he's not. You're, you're in a mode of going, I just lost my livelihood and this guy looks like Prince Charming because he's bought me dinner a couple of times, filled my car with gas, you know, pay, he, he's, you know, chump changing you. And so you think, oh, he's my savior. And then you, you, you know, marry the guy or start dating the guy and you find out he's an ogre. So you got to wait until you're there. That's when you want to offer yourself up to somebody is when you're at your best, not when you're broken. And so I've told my sisters this and many other female friends and what have you. And I go, look, and by the way, this is true of guys too. If you're down on your luck and, and some girl comes along, she's like, look, I got it. You know, I'll pick up the check. Okay, fine. I'm not telling you, you know, everybody doesn't need a little help, but you can't make your decisions based on that. Guys tend not to, we tend to be like, nah, you know, we have a different mindset and I'll leave it at that. We can talk about it in another show, but that's, the difference women will see this guy's Prince charming guys will see it as like, all right, well I'll hang around, you know, take advantage of it for a bit until I find miss Wright or whatever. But women they are like, no, you're it. Oh my gosh. So anyway, she says, I studied economics in college and went to New York to become an investment banker to be blunt. I wanted the freedom money can buy. I had a sudden change of heart while working at Goldman Sachs as a summer analyst. I decided that if the world required me to sell the hours of my life in exchange for access to what had long ago been free, food, water, shelter, I wanted to at least be doing something that stirred my soul. This is granted a privileged position. But as a young woman, this was the conclusion I came to. Before I get to the conclusion, I want to tell you she gave us a hint as to her ideology because she says that, you know, food, water and shelter were free. Yeah, maybe years ago, if you want to be in a cave it food, water and shelter can be free right now. If you want to drink nasty water, it can be free right now. But I digress. So she says, I had discovered acting and filmmaking in college and the more time I spent immersed in it, the more I liked the person I became. I listened more acutely. I was more emphatic and imaginative. These are qualities that seem to, to be culturally on the decline. Our culture lacks forward thinking talkers who can turn a profit without feeling uh, too much about who may suffer the consequences. Usually poor people, people of color and women acting felt like a noble pursuit and maybe even a small act of resistance. 
I don't know if that's how actors feel. But I will tell you this. What she said about opening your imagination and things like that, I completely agree. I think everybody should pursue an art in some form or another, music or drawing or whatever. Anyway, she says, Hollywood was, of course, a rude awakening to the kind of idealism. I quickly realized that a large portion of the town functioned inside a soft and sometimes literal trafficking or prostitution of young women, a commodity with an endless supply and an endless demand. The storytellers, the people with economic and artistic power are, by and large, straight white men. As of 2017, women make up only 23% of the Directors Guild of America and only 11% are people of color. White men tend to tell stories from their perspective, as one naturally does, which means women are genuinely underwritten, generally underwritten. They don't necessarily even need names. Bikini Babe 2, Blonde 4 are parts I audition for. If the female characters are lucky enough to have names, they are usually designed only to ask the questions that prompt the lead male monologue, or they're quickly killed in service to the to advancing the plot. Now I want to stop there for a second and say, she's explaining Hollywood, telling you the inside scoop. It's a male, white male dominated society. Remember when Michelle Obama pointed across the aisle and talked about the white men over there? She's pointing to the very same men, but the problem is these men aren't conservatives these men aren't right you know right wingers who are keeping their thumb on you know their their boot on the neck of the of the females in america no these are white men who are keeping their feet and and other body parts on the various pe- portions of the bodies of Amer- of Amer- of american women and being blamed acting as if these people are the conservatives it's not us so she's telling you straight up there's not enough blacks, there's not enough women, which for the record, I don't care. I don't care who makes films. If a film is good, I'll watch it. I don't care who makes it. Does a perspective matter? Of course it does. I'd love to see more good films from a black perspective, but it isn't like somebody's stopping us. If I wanted to, I could make them. Anyway, here's what she says. Once when I was standing in line for some open call audition for a horror film, I remember catching my reflection in the mirror and realizing I was dressed like a sex object. Every woman in line for the audition for nurse was, it seemed, was it seemed, it was for nurse. Uh, she says, we had all internalized on some level the idea that if we were going to be cast, we'd better sell what was desired. Not our artistry, not our imaginations, but our bodies. It was around this time that I remember sitting in a casual gathering where a straight white male activist said, Our gender and race has all the power. So when you want to have sex with a woman, you have to ask and get her verbal consent, he continued. If that woman is a person of color, she is oppressed by both her gender and her race, then you should really ask twice. The literalism of his ratio was ridiculously reductive and his declarative tone off-putting, but I appreciated that he was trying to articulate how complicated it is to negotiate the invisible forces of privilege and power inside sexual encounters. He was trying to help other young men understand why it can sometimes be hard for any woman to find and voice no within a culture that has taught her to mistrust herself or to value herself through male approval. That is the biggest bunch of hogwash that I've ever heard. If you treat, if you train your children, boys to respect women and women, girls, young girls to respect themselves, that is nonsense. Everything she just said. But what's funny about it is how it came to be, and she's listening to a male activist who's talking about this stuff, and none of them know anything about it. They've, they've been in this liberal bubble that makes them think that they're intellectuals understanding the, the human psyche as it relates to sex and, and other human interactions, and it's nonsense. She says, I emerged from this period thinking about the power dynamics inside Hollywood. If auditioning for parts was largely about seeking male approval, and the stories themselves were narratives I didn't always politically or morally agree with, then the only way for me to navigate Hollywood with more, uh, with more agency was to become a storyteller myself. That's an easy thing to say and very hard to do. I stopped auditioning. 
I worked a day job, spent nights and weekends at the public library downtown reading screenwriting books. I did this for years. Eventually, I co-wrote and starred in two films and was very fortunate when they were programmed at Sundance in 2011. So, stop there. This young lady, she's a, obviously bright, going to work for Goldman Sachs, says I took some time off, wanted to learn acting, found out that acting was very male-dominated, not by us, not by conservative men, by leftist men who still treat women as objects and yada, yada, yada. And you've heard me talk about Holly Weird and the fact that they can say you're too fat, you're too ugly, you're too white, you're too black, and tell you how to be. So she didn't like that. And she says, you know, I felt objectified. So what did I do? I went and decided I was going to become a storyteller. I, she analyzed it the way a management consultant will, like a Goldman Sachs type. And she said, here's what I need to do. And she took it and she became successful. And in 2011, she got two films green lighted at Sundance. And bada bing, bada boom, life is good. And she says, I'm taking you through this brief history because I think it's important to understanding when Harvey Weinstein requested a meeting with me in 2014, when the industry had deemed I was legitimate fresh meat. And I was in some ways in a slightly different position from many who had walked the gauntlet before me. I too went to the meeting thinking that my entire life was about to change for the better. And I want to come back and make a point about this that I think you're going to find intriguing. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics this is the kevin jackson radio show welcome back everybody kevin jackson here i'm talking about an article that i read and it was a powerful woman her name is Britt marling and and she's explaining in the atlantic how she met harvey weinstein and she had decided that she did not want to go to weinstein as a whiny little actress but more as a storyteller someone who's written a screenplay And Harvey Weinstein could either say, yeah, I want it or not, but she was then free to produce her own stuff, yada, yada, yada. And I love the article because it's got so many contradictions. He's talking about the inner belly, the inner workings of Hollywood, the ugly uh, underbelly. And she's saying, you know, things like, well, Hollywood is set up for white, uh, old white men. And I'm thinking, where have I heard that before? These are old white leftist men that nobody's complained about. And Harvey Weinstein not only tells you what old white leftist men are willing to do when they're in positions of power. And we're just starting to see this revelation. And oh, by the way, even as of this, I don't know how long it's been. Harvey Weinstein was in uh, rehab for a week. That was a few days ago. We learned about the allegations a couple of weeks before he went into rehab. So we're pretty close to a month in on all the inner workings of Hollywood, the the dirty nature of the beast and nobody's named anybody else they all allude to there being others but nobody said a word so i want to go back to mrs marling's ms marling Britt marling's article where she's talking about now she's had her first meeting with harvey after she's been to uh sundance film festival with two successful films in 2011 and we fast forwarded to 2014 a meeting with her and Harvey Weinstein. 
She says, when the industry had deemed I was legitimate fresh meat, I was in some ways in a slightly different position from many who had walked this gauntlet before me. I, too, went to the meeting thinking that perhaps my entire life would change for the better. I, too, was asked to meet him in a hotel bar. I, too, met a young female assistant there who said the meeting had been moved upstairs to the suite because he was a very busy man. I, too, felt my guard go up, but was calmed by the presence of another woman my age. By the way, a woman who represents women, leftist women in Hollywood, who knows what's about to happen and gleefully, gladly sets up this woman to go up to Harvey's suite. I, too, she said, felt terror in the pit of my stomach when that young woman left the room and I was suddenly alone with him. I, too, was asked if I wanted a massage, champagne, strawberries. I, too, sat in that chair paralyzed by mounting fear when he suggested we shower together. What could I do? How not to offend this man, this gatekeeper who could anoint or destroy me? Now, I could go back to the time when I talked about women can make a choice. We all have choices in life to decide, do I want to go for the money, go for the gusto, or do I want to go for, you know, my morality? Do I want to sleep well at night being who I am? And this woman, well, I'm not going to finish. Let me finish the story with her later. But many of these starlets, and we did a, a thing, it was called, Uh, Harvey's girls, eight women who were supposedly slept their way to the top. And it had the girl from hunger games and it had Jessica Alba. And I'm just naming a couple. I remember off the top of my head. And I don't know whether they slept their way to the top or not. That's what somebody else alludes to. That's in, in a Hollywood insider. Would it surprise you to learn that these women succumbed to some degree to Harvey Weinstein? Here's what I can tell you about both. Jennifer, whatever this girl's name is, that did the Hunger Games and also Jessica Alba. Neither one of those girls is anything to write home about. Neither one. Jen, I mean, you could say Jessica Alba is a pretty girl, but pretty girls are a dime a dozen in Hollywood. She's not a great actress. That's for sure. The other girl is supposedly some great actress. I've watched a few of her films and you could have put you could have put any person in there and I wouldn't have noticed the difference in the role. I'm just being honest. Her role in Hunger Games wasn't so unique that you were like, oh, my gosh, she so captured it. I've seen roles that you go, man, that is only there's only two people or one person that could do that role and sell it. So don't talk to me about this. These girls being so amazing and they came out of nowhere. Oh, you know who the other one is? Sienna Miller. Sienna Miller was in uh, the movie with uh, uh, where. uh, Chris Kyle's she played Chris Kyle's wife married to uh, uh, I can't remember actors names, but he's a, a considered a hunky dude and a, he played Chris Kyle. Anyway, Sienna Miller came out of nowhere. I didn't I had never seen this woman in anything. And suddenly, bada bing, bada boom, she's in three, four movies, uh, movies that I was like, oh, that's Sienna Miller. Saw one the other night. I went, that's Sienna Miller. <gasps> Whoa. Didn't put two and two together until the Harvey Weinstein the thing that we found where it said these eight are actresses who are rumored to have slept their way to the top. There you go. New name to kick around Sienna Miller. And I will tell you, I've seen her act. Nothing. There are so many actresses in Hollywood who are looking for work. Why am I knowing about these ladies now? Cause they all got decent bodies, decent faces, and they all knew Harvey. So anyway, back to this, this girl who's now fine. She finds herself, with Harvey Weinstein and she's in his room under the same circumstances as other girls. And now I want to finish this thing. She says it was clear. There was only one direction. He wanted this encounter to go. And that was sex or some version of an erotic exchange. I was able to gather myself together, a bundle of firing nerves, hands trembling voice lost in my throat and leave the room. I later sat in my hotel room alone and wept. I wept because I'd gone up the elevator when I knew better. Okay, that's what Bernice, Eddie Bernice Johnson said. Why would you put yourself in that situation? You say to Harvey Weinstein, if we're going to have a meeting, we need to have the meeting down here or the meeting doesn't occur. Nobody's too busy to ride an elevator down and tell you, hey, here's what I'm thinking about. 
Don't try to play me. But she didn't. She went upstairs. She says, I wept because I let him touch my shoulders. <gasps> oh, my goodness. I wept because at other times in my life, under other circumstances, I had not been able to leave. Now, I don't know what that was. She didn't elaborate. But here's what she eventually says. She says, but eventually I left. She says, the actress in me wanted to stay. But the writer in me, the director, the producer, the person who has the talent that wrote these pictures that Harvey Weinstein is potentially going to look at for me, was the one who left. So here's my point to this. Women put to say, oh, well, I was vulnerable. That's why I went up there and Harvey was able to take advantage of me. But had I done what I should have done, which is to prepare myself for the potential eventuality to say, look, I'm never going to be held prisoner by anybody because one, I'm financially independent. And two, I have the talent to get my own things produced. We wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, look. There are many guys out there that want to sell screenplays. They they don't have anything Harvey Weinstein wants. I don't know where Harvey gets his work. Does he buy all of his screenplays from women? Because guys go in there with their screenplays. They have no physical attributes that I can think. Of. I don't think Harvey's gay. Harvey Weinstein is gay. So they go in and go, hey, Harvey, here's what we got. Here's my pitch for my show. Here's my pitch for my movie, my, t- my TV show, whatever it may be. And Harvey Weinstein sits there and goes, yeah, he's still God. What, what's he requiring of guys? Here's the point. Guys don't have anything to offer except talent. That's why we excel at it. That's why we do it. That's why we say, you know what? I'm going to write something spectacular. I'm going to do something spectacular because I don't have feminine wiles. Women know that they can use these feminine wiles and get things done. And and the choice is yours. I get that Harvey, you know, wouldn't let some people leave through a door while he watered the plant. Now I'm using my finger quotes on that. Okay. Horrible thing to happen. Disgusting or whatever. And perhaps Harvey forced himself on a woman or two in his hotel room, which makes him even a bigger scumbag. But the fact is the majority of these women, who decided that they were going to build their careers and they have built massive careers. Gwyneth Paltrow, one of the biggest female stars out there. Uh, Angelina Jolie, big star. Many others. They could have said no. They could have just flatly said, I ain't doing it. And to my other point, and I've been making this for a long time, what if all the women said, we're not sleeping our way to the top in Hollywood, period. You're going to revaluate us and our talent. You know what you would be? Women? You would become men then, because that's all we have. We don't have anything to negotiate with Harvey with. So this girl wants to say the man part of her left that room. He won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. The Kevin Jackson Radio Show. What's up, everybody? Welcome. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. KJRadio.com. I've got some good news and some bad news. You tell me how you want it. You want the good news? You want the bad news? You'll figure it out. But here's what I'll tell you. Terror cases in Germany have quadrupled. They said more evidence revealing the ridiculousness of centrist position on immigration Namely, that refugees can seamlessly integrate into European society without a spike in crime or terror has emerged courtesy of the German newspaper Welt am Sonntag, which revealed Sunday that the number of terrorism related cases instigated, investigated rather by German authorities has quadrupled over the past year. Now, you guys have heard me go into these stats that have told you. By decade, how many terror attacks we had worldwide related to Muslim terror. And it's staggering. They said prosecutors have opened more than 900 cases so far this year in Germany. 
compared to just 240 throughout 2016 and 80 cases in 2013. Now, remember what I told you before. In the entire world, in the 70s, one Islamic terror case in Saudi Arabia in, in the decade of the 80s. In the 90s, 13, in the, uh, I'm sorry, in the uh, 70s, uh, one in the 80s, 13 in the 90s, 35, and in the year 2000, just one year, we had well over 1,000. It's been no less than 2,500 every year since the year 2000. Now, ask yourself what happened. The only thing that happened was Muslim migration. Iran, in the, in the early 1980s, the mullahs took over, started exporting terror, and now we have terror all over the world. Germany, here are your numbers again. 80 cases in all of 2013. 240 cases in 2016. 900 cases in 2017. Not even the year finished. Now ask yourself, plot that on a curve. It's called an exponential curve. And ask yourself, what will it be next year in Germany in 2018? If they've gone from 80 to 240 to 900 plus. You're talking about thousands. It said Germany's federal police estimates 705 Islamic extremists willing to carry out terror attacks are active in the country. Up to 600 during an estimate up from 600 rather during an estimate from an estimate in February Germany's domestic intelligence agency recently said around 24,400 Islamists are active in the country, but most of them don't pose an immediate terror threat. So I want you to think about those numbers yet again, 80 in 2013, 240 in 2000 and 2016, 900 so far this year, 24,000 plus Islamic jihadists that they say uh, don't pose an immediate threat. <clears throat> well, who did who posed an immediate threat in 2013 when there were 80 attacks that led to 240 in 2016? Who posed a, an immediate threat from 2016 to 2017 where the number went from 240 to 900? I'm just curious. This is ridiculous. So this is what we've got to address in America and around the world. But if you bring it up, well, you're considered Islamophobic. And see, that's how Germany finds itself in the predicament that it finds itself. Because now they've got 24,000 plus terrorists ready to go. They're watching the spike in numbers. They're watching the German people go, whoa, wait a minute. They said the number of migrants applying for asylum in Germany plummeted. I love this plummeted to about 280,000 in 2016, about one third the number from the prior year. But the increase in crime, coupled with the Christian Democratic Union's embarrassing showing in federal elections last month, are slowly inspiring the country's centrists to accept that more needs to be done to limit and control immigration in Europe's largest economy. Think about this. They went down to 280,000 folks. Down. And they've got 24,000 jihadis roaming around the country. Now, 280,000 people can, I mean, that have a, a goal to breed you out of existence can do a pretty good job. We're already starting to see it. The world is beginning to see this. People better wake up. You better wake up before it's too late. Islam is not waging jihad in the way that it did before. Yes, there are some radicals out there doing what they're doing, but the moderates, the ones who are coming over here and just pretending not to care, they're helping to build the numbers. And that's why Detroit is Islamabad. What's this, the town outside of Michigan? That's it's completely Islamic. And look, I don't I have no issue with Muslims in and of themselves. I have a problem with their religion, what they call a religion. I don't believe it to be one. But we've got to address this. Look, this goes on. It says uh, Germany's federal prosecutor's office can't keep up with the increase in the number of cases. To wit, nearly 300 cases have been transferred to the state level. Not all cases involve plans to carry out attacks. 
Migrants from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan have been tried over alleged membership in terror groups without being suspected of planning attacks on European soil. So these people are members of terror groups, but because they haven't planned attacks, they can't link them directly to an attack. They're like, well, we really can't deal with that. They said in the left wing scene, left wing scene, the German states have currently estimated a number that can be counted on the finger of one hand. In the right wing scene, the number is in the low double digits. Frustration over this increase in crime manifested last month in the far right alternative for Germany's party sweeping electoral triumph. The party, while still a minority, received 13 percent of the vote, earning it a place in parliament. First time a far right party has held a spot in the legislature since World War II. It's now the third strongest party in Germany, created a headache for Chancellor Merkel by busting up her ruling coalition. So when you think this is something unique to us, that we're the only ones fighting it, let me tell you, what we do, the world is beginning to notice. The United States is starting to export its strength yet again, its sanity, and saying, I don't care what Barack Obama or anybody else tells you about Muslims. You look at their migration path, you look at your crime rate, your rapes, and all the other negatives that come into society, and it is growing at the rate at which they are growing. I don't know what else to tell you. And when we come back for Drinker Wilson. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville, author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all too familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Hey everybody, welcome back. Kevin Jackson here. KJRadio.com 24-7. Anytime you want to check us out, you can go there. So, uh, hey, I learned something new about Congresswoman Frederica Wilson. We looked at her donor base. Many of the top 100 donors to the controversial Democratic representative are foes of and sometimes the targets of President Trump, including the NFL, Planned Parenthood, the liberal leftist trade unions. Wilson, who was accused, who has accused rather the White House of racism and insensitivity and a call to the gold star family, gobbled up thousands of dollars from insurance firms, too. This is according to campaign finance data. So Wilson has gotten money from Planned Parenthood, the trade unions, both of whom are anti-black. 
Undoubtedly, they're anti-black. The unions were set up to keep blacks from working. Planned Parenthood was set up to kill black people. And the NFL, I don't know. <laughs> make them rich, then make them poor, maybe. <laughs> but those two, the Planned Parenthood and the trade unions, I don't find unusual because they're counter intuitive to black support. There's no reason we should support either. And yet we do. And that's why Frederica Wilson and members of the Congressional Black Caucus are the stooges of the unions and Planned Parenthood. That's just the facts. They do the dirty work. Planned Parenthood can't tell you, hey, look, we want to kill black people. It's really that simple. They wouldn't get any donations. They, people would be like, that's appalling. The left would leave them in droves. The right has already left them. We don't care about them. We think they're a, a heinous group. And the unions want blacks to have menial jobs. They don't look, look at the unions. Look at the, the leadership of the unions. Look at how they're run. They are run truly mafioso style. And like the mafia, there aren't that, there weren't that many black people leading a mafia family. In fact, I hate to say this. I don't want to spoil anybody from watching these mafia films, but the, there's not many black people in mafia films. And usually when there are, they get killed. Yeah. So, you know, what, what do you want me to say? There's no, there's no future with the unions for blacks. None. There's only one black executive in the union. His name is Jerry Hudson that I know of. I don't know if Jerry's still with SCIU, but he was. And he plainly said, I, I was on Cavuto talking about this guy years ago. And he plainly said, black people are stupid. I can have them do whatever I want in the union. And there was ne- the Republicans didn't even seize on it. It's hard to believe you. They could have run an ad and say, hey, black people, I here's what a dude who's risen within the union ranks said about you. I'm just saying. And they could have cut it like a chicken commercial, you know, with a big old thick baseline. Jerry Hudson said black people are stupid. You know, get a big base dude reading it. You know, black people are so stupid. That's what Jerry Hudson said. You sure you want to be union? Oh, and get some fried chicken. <laughs> That's what they do. That's how they advertise to us. So the the unions are are completely anti-black. So is Planned Parenthood. Neither one of them has the guts to say it, but they are. And black people will vote for them. We got representation, yeah. And Frederica Wilson gladly accepts their money and then goes out and she's pro-union. She's pro-Planned Parenthood. I don't care how many black babies it kills. I don't care about how many jobs the unions take away from blacks, menial jobs they give us, whatever. They don't care. They don't care if the union brings in, you know, allows millions of illegals to come in and take jobs away from poor black folks that are looking for jobs. Racism and insensitivity, though, is what Frederica Wilson says of Donald Trump. And I'm looking at the evidence going, if there's anybody racial and insensitive to black folks, it's the congressional black circus members. In 2016, 22 unions, teachers and the National Football League gave money to Frederica Wilson. Wow. And President Trump targeted those groups and has been a target of them. But I already get, told you guys, the money is drying up for the DNC. Now, Frederica might get hers. She might get her cut because she's out there, you know, helping those anti-black groups. But the DNC is struggling. What else do we want to talk about? Who else is struggling? Here's a story I really like. It has to do with a coffee shop. Anti-police coffee shop closes. Yeah. The owner of a, and, and this is what makes this story interesting, is the, the owner of the, the shop, the, the shop is located in Massachusetts. And the owner said she's closing the business because there was a backlash following her daughter's controversial comments about cops on Facebook. Cato Melly, the owner of the year-old White Rose Coffee House in Lynn, Massachusetts, said she was closing the store, quote, so I can stop being harassed. I've lost my business and I've lost my daughter. I don't know how this story just keeps building, but I need people to leave me alone. Meal or Malay or whatever. She says, in closing my business so I can stop being harassed. 
She tried to make amends with police after her daughter, Sophie, the store's manager, wrote on her personal Facebook page last weekend that the business would never host a coffee with a cop event. The post started a debate that took a different turn when Sophie called police officers bullies and racists. And in turn, social media users called for people to ban the coffee house. Millet or Meal, whatever she is, she fired her daughter, wrote police an apology, calling the remarks distasteful, biased, and hateful. She invited officers to the coffee shop that following Monday for coffee. She says, I don't agree with what she said. It's not my opinion. I should never have been linked to my business. It should never have been linked to my business. And that's where I parted ways with my daughter in regards to the business. The police didn't show up and neither did regular morning customers. So she's out. Now, look, I feel sorry for the mom because her daughter did something stupid. But hey, it's Massachusetts. Apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. But here's what's really most intriguing about the story. It's in Massachusetts. Did I mention that? This is the heart of liberalism. I don't know where Lynn is. It wasn't Boston, Boston, but I don't know where Lynn is. Is it a suburb or what? But the people of Massachusetts said, you're not going to disrespect the cops. This isn't Texas people. This is Massachusetts. How many times have I said that now? (laughs) This is Massachusetts. Sounds like a rhyme to a song. This is Massachusetts, baby. (laughs) But that does floor me that the citizens of Massachusetts would actually band together and take a stance against a liberal idea. We need to find out where Lynn is. Is Lynn like a little because that's little town stuff. That's not Boston stuff. Boston, I can't imagine that people would have, you know, ostracized this lady. I predict if it was in Boston, she'd have a thriving business with her daughter having done that. But you know what goes to show her kid. You can't just go willy nilly making these statements about police without there being some form of penance you're going to have to do. And her mother's having to close the shop. That's a pretty big hit. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. I want to play a clip from Hillary Clinton. She's overseas, leaving Europe, doing a book tour. She's run out of places to try to hawk her book. She's <laughs> she was in the aisles at Costco trying to sell this stupid book. What happened? <laughs> but now she's overseas. She got booed over there. Did you guys hear about that? She got booed. And at a soccer game, opening first day, I guess they're having a playoff or something, they were saying, please, Mr. Trump, lock her up. That was a big chant. I'm talking a full soccer stadium, folks. It had to be 75,000, 80,000 people. Lock her up. Even overseas. She's getting heckled. Well, As I've said about Democrats for a long time, I tell you, a Democrat will will call you a racist knowing they're racist. They will call you sexist knowing they're sexist. They will call you homophobe knowing they're homophobes. You name it. A Democrat will tell you what they're, they'll say, you need to stop with all your shenanigans and you're, and they're telling you exactly what they do. Almost each and every time you can set your watch by it. (laughs) It's so true to form. Hillary Clinton says of uh, Donald Trump, he's colluding with the Russians, knowing that she's colluding with the Russians. And it's a great strategy. It can be when you have everybody lined up the way the, the, the DNC, the Democrats, Hillary Clinton and those people do. It's a great strategy. Yeah, Trump, look at what he's doing. He's using the Russians to fix the election. Everybody, oh my gosh, he's using the Russians to fix the election. Look at that. They're using and Trump goes, I have no ties to the Russians. Zero. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton's got I mean, it is so obvious the ties to the Russians. 
you, I remember telling you guys this when it happened. I said, you know what's interesting about this? Hillary Clinton has exponentially more ties to the Russians, in your face ties to the Russians that should be investigated. And they're running around looking at Donald Trump. It is patently ridiculous. And I was right. It's amazing. During an interview with C-SPAN, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton tried to downplay what probably is the biggest scandal in modern American history. See, literally gives you the play-by-play for what the left have tried to do with Donald Trump for well over a year now. And I want to play the clip so you get a chance to hear it. Sean Hannity on his program has been very critical of the Uranium One deal. The president saying with regard to Russia, that's the real story in all of this. What would you say to those critics? I would say it's the same baloney they've been peddling for years. And there's been no no credible evidence by anyone. In fact, it's been debunked repeatedly and will continue to be debunked. But here's what they're doing. And really, I have to give them credit. You know, Trump and his allies, including Fox News, are really experts at distraction and diversion. So the closer the investigation about real Russian ties between Trump associates and real Russians, as we heard Jeff Sessions finally admit to uh, in his testimony the other day, the more they want to just throw mud on the wall and I'm their favorite target, me and, you know, President Obama. We're the ones that they always like to put into the crosshairs. Um, so, yes, I, I'm, I'm not surprised, but I think the real story is how nervous they are about these continuing investigations. <laughs> Welcome back. If you're the, if, uh, hopefully you're ahead of me because you've been trained well at the Blacksville University, Chancellor Kevin Jackson, professor. At the very end, what did Hillary Clinton say? Oh, you know, they're they're running very scared because of the investigation. She told you what's going on with her. She's running very scared. A uh, couple things before we get back to the actual facts of revolving this case. One, did you guys see Hillary Clinton speaking at Yale? She's got these arm, you know how they do this. I've only seen these with people who are like, uh, they have cerebral palsy or something. But you stick your arm between this little loop and then your hand on a, a it's not a cane, but like a walker. And so it it's it's a crutch. It's like a, a cane in each hand, but it's got the, the little band around it so you don't lose them if you happen to slip up or something. And Hillary Clinton was at Yale University wearing these things and nobody said a word. We reported it, but you can't see the mainstream media is not talking about this. They haven't said a single word about her health. She nobody's holding her up. She's using these cane like things that wrap around your arm your forearm, and then you put your hand through it and it looks like a cane. That's what she's using to walk. Now, I've told many people during the campaign, I told people, I said, Hillary Clinton's sick. I don't, and and I will even say this, I'll go a step further with this. I find it interesting that Hillary Clinton is sick. It's the same with McCain. I talked about it the other day. They're sick. I'm not talking about being leftist. They're physically ill. And neither one of them wants to give it up and say, you know what? I don't have a whole lot of time left. I'm going to go and do something meaningful. Hillary Clinton, as I said about McCain yesterday, this guy's got brain cancer. We don't even know how long he'll be lucid, right? I would be all over the place trying to just enjoy life. What's he doing? He's over there giving innuendo about being mad at Trump. Yeah, you know, you couldn't get a deferment for bone spurs. Unless you're rich. So you have that angle. Well, Hillary Clinton's in the same boat. She's lost for the presidency twice. She's now supposedly looking at a a teaching position at Yale or somewhere. No, Columbia. Why would you do any of that? You've got a boatload of money and you could end up in prison. So go spend some money. I, I would be... I mean, I ain't going to say I'd make it rain in the wrong places, but I would be lavishing money on people and doing philanthropic stuff, making people feel good about who I was. I would want to go out feeling good. Hillary Clinton wants to go out under a cloud of of under this murky umbrella. I don't get it. The other thing I want you to notice about what she said, though, 
is he brought up, well, you know, they always use, you know, me and Barack Obama. Nobody said anything about Obama. He says, I'm their favorite target, me and President Obama. We're the ones they like to put in the crosshairs. No, you're the ones who end up in the crosshairs. That's the problem. And But what, why did she bring up Obama? That was the reason why I stopped in talking about it. Hillary Clinton still runs under the delusion that Barack Obama is an important person in politics. He's not. The left don't want to admit this. Barack Obama's been marginalized. He was marginalized when Trump won on November the 8th. That was the beginning. That was pretty much repudiation of everything Barack Obama. Since then, it's been far worse on Obama, as we all know. So he's meaningless politically. It's the same with Donna Brazil. It's the same with Debbie Wasserman Schultz. It's the same with Pelosi. It's the same with many of these people. They aren't even players any longer. They miss it. They want it. They like it. They love it. They want some more of it. <laughs> so she brings up Barack Obama in hopes that it'll it'll be like, well, not only are they targeting me, the woman, they're targeting the minority, that black guy, Barack Obama. She thinks it's going to work because it's worked so many times before. Why not? Uranium One has been debunked, according to Hillary Clinton. So all that talk around the facts of Uranium One, we should dismiss. Apparently that's what Hillary thinks. So let's look at the facts. Here's fact one. The New York Times confirmed Schweitzer's Uranium One revelations in a 4,000-page front-page story by a Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter, and the story detailed how the Russian energy giant Rosatom stealthily acquired Canadian firm, a Canadian firm with three separate purchases between 2009 and 2013. This timeline coincides with Hillary's timeline as Secretary of State. Now I'm going from memory on this deal, but somehow Hillary orchestrated this sale to the Russians, and this is kind of what got the ball rolling on all of this stuff. So that's my recollection. Now, you guys do the research, but the facts are, and this is in the New York Times. You can look this up. It's also Schweitzer uh, and Schweitzer's book where he talks about it. I forget Clinton Cash, I think is his name, but it's in there. And you can see all the dirty dealings of the Clintons and how this was orchestrated. And I promise you, if you only had that one fact of how that got the ball rolling, because apparently we couldn't, the Russians couldn't buy it directly from the United States. They had to go through an intermediary. So the Canadian company bought it and then the Russians bought it from them. It was something along those lines. And I'm going from memory. I, I wish I'd had more time to do the research on this. But that's where the fun part of the show comes in. You get to go out and do your homework. And then we can report back together on it. Got to take a short break. When we come back, I'm going to give you three other facts that are Pretty damning when it comes to the Clintons. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com
putting an end to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. John Hannity on his program has been very critical of the Uranium One deal. The president saying with regard to Russia, that's the real story in all of this. What would you say to those critics? I would say it's the same baloney they've been peddling for years. And there's been no no credible evidence by anyone. In fact, it's been debunked repeatedly and will continue to be debunked. But here's what they're doing. And really, I have to give them credit. You know, Trump and his allies, including Fox News, are really experts at distraction and diversion. So the closer the investigation about real Russian ties between Trump associates and real Russians, as we heard Jeff Sessions finally admit to uh, in his testimony the other day, The more they want to just throw mud on the wall and I'm their favorite target, me and, you know, President Obama. We're the ones that they always like to put into the crosshairs. Um, So, yes, I'm I'm not surprised, but I think the real story is how nervous they are about these continuing investigations. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Kevin Jackson. It's Kevin Jackson Show. KJRadio.com. Hillary Clinton says there's nothing. It's baloney. She says all the stuff that has to do with Uranium One's been debunked. Meanwhile, they're opening up, reopening investigations on Podesta. They're opening investigations on this Russian company. I mean, investigations are flying. And as the old saying goes, if there's one buzzard circling, maybe something died. But if there's 50 buzzards circling, something died. And there's 50 buzzards circling around this carcass. And I was talking about the facts because Hillary says there's no fact. Look at all the, the things that are pointed to Donald Trump. And I looked it up. I'll get to that in just a second. But as I said, Hillary Clinton and the left tell you what they're thinking. They told us that there was a that they need to look into Donald Trump because of his ties to the Russians. As Hillary Clinton knew her tentacles were all over the Kremlin. But in order to make herself look innocent, she must expose you. It's like the person that goes to the cops and says, hey, there's a guy that was uh, looking into my house. And I don't know, maybe he's going to kill my wife. (laughs) And then the wife dies. Now, I warned you, I told you. And the cops go, well, it couldn't have been him because, I mean, he's he he said it. He's the one that said there were people trying to kill his wife. I mean, look, I've seen far too many of these stories, these scenarios. But what I've noticed and look, this didn't just come out all of a sudden. This is years of observation, which is what I'm good at. And I've said every time the Democrats have said he's a racist, he's a sexist where I go, wow, it turns out that person was racist or sexist. They'll get some undercover video of somebody going and doggone Negroes and still sleeping Negroes and we'll have them voting for us. And we love that them stupid Negroes are stupid and they love the Democrats. <laughs> some cocktail party. And you're going, wow, that's the guy that claims to fight for the Negro. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? The, the hypocrisy of the left, it's boundless. What are you looking for? Are you looking to cage it? You cannot do this. Harvey Weinstein is a perfect example. The NFL is a perfect example. Let's take a knee because we are so oppressed in America. Little princesses, little little snowflakes out on the football field. Oh, my gosh. We've been affronted. Black people are getting arrested by police. It's horrible. Oh, yeah, let me go get in my $250,000 car and go to my million-plus-dollar house with a police escort. <laughs> it's crazy. They get away. These same black athletes, the cops show up and go, can I have your autograph? And they want to take a knee. Man, the, the cops are just really doing stuff. No, I don't believe that's the case. I believe it's you doing stuff to the cops. I believe it's you getting away with a lot and the cops letting you. They have people to do nothing but manage the cops for people like these NFLers. So whether it's the police and the cops, I mean, the cops and the black folks, whether it's Harvey Weinstein and women and this so-called war on women we're supposed to be having, the, the left put their, they put their dirty right in front of your face. Harvey Weinstein throwing party after party in the same presence of women that multiple of them in a room knew exactly what Harvey did. Can you imagine? It was like my uncle when I was growing up, my uncle, I don't know how many times he was married or had baby, baby mamas, 
But we'd go to a re- family reunion. There'd be at least four of his, his women there, you know, like ex-women. And and they're getting along and whatever. You know, there's no cat fights. And I used to marvel. I'd be like, wow, that's pretty impressive. I'm more impressed with Harvey Weinstein throwing lavish parties, inviting the very people that he's molested and raped and whatever else. And they all show up and they look at each other and they don't even compare notes. They just do it. They're, oh, Harvey's wonderful. And they all got pictures with him. Hello, hello, look at me. Ha, ha, ha. Meanwhile, Trump has locker room talk and says, man, I tell you what, these girls, when you're a billionaire, when you're like a, a mover and a shaker, they'll let you do whatever. And he's saying they'll let you do. It, they, in other words, they're like, please do it. Harvey Weinstein's like blocking people from getting out the door. Same as Bill Clinton. But the sanctimonious left, who, by the way, accuse us of being sanctimonious. Look at those Bible thumpers over there. It, look, I'm a Bible thumper, but I would... If somebody said to me, yeah, Kevin, one of your friends, he, you know, he sexually uh, harassed a woman or what, I'd be like, well, you know, I, okay. What do you want me to say? Oh, conservatives would never do that. I would never say something like that. But I'll tell you this. He, let's make sure we do know all the facts. If he said, hey, that's a nice dress or, hey, listen, Eileen, um, I've noticed you, you know, over around the office. It doesn't appear you're married. You mind if we go have a drink sometime? I could imagine that. <laughs> and somebody going, he molested me. But these guys, man, they put it right in your face what they do. And then dare you to prove that you're not the one doing it while they're getting away with it. <laughs> it is so ridiculous that the amount of time we spend investigating Trump with, with Russia, when right in front of our faces, we've been saying it, we've been sounding the alarm bell for a better part of two years, but is that all the evidence you need? I ask a question, why would the Russians want Trump as president when they got a deal with Hillary Clinton that gets our our uh, uranium? What else do you want? Vladimir, if he wanted anybody as president, he wanted the person he can buy, and that's the Clintons. Hillary Clinton, easily buyable. Got 145 mil to put into the foundation. Give Bill a $500,000 speech. Anyway, let's go and look at these other points, these factoids, these other facts around the case. The Hill. By the way, the New York Times was the first one that we talked about. Now it's The Hill. These are not The Daily Caller or Breitbart. The Hill reported that ahead of the deal, the FBI uncovered, quote, substantial evidence that Russian nuclear industry officials were engaged in bribery kickbacks, extortion, money laundering. The effort centered around the expansion of Russia's nuclear footprint in the United States as early as 2009. The agency also found that the Russian nuclear officials had routed $145 million to the Clinton Foundation. The Obama Justice Department, run by Eric Holder, sat on the evidence for four years before looking to prosecute, by which time the deal had been approved. Now, I don't know how much... Uh, does that constitute as a smoking gun? <laughs> the Russians are engaged in bribery, kickback, extortion, and money laundering, send $145 million to the Clintons, and Hillary goes, oh, no, it's been completely debunked. I tell you what, where's the money, Hillary? Pretty evident they did it. it you can't even cover that up. <laughs> it's just in your face. I mentioned this other one already. Bill Clinton received $500,000 for a speech in Moscow paid for by a Kremlin-backed bank. Remember when they told everybody, oh, Donald Trump's involved with a bank in Kremlin? Nothing. But here's Bill Clinton gets paid by a Kremlin-backed bank shortly after Russia announced its intentions to get a majority of stake, a majority stake in that Canadian company I mentioned. And um, according to the Times, Clinton traveled to Moscow June of 2010, the same month in which Rosatom struck its deal for the majority stake in Uranium One. Coincidental? Here's another factoid. According to the Times, the Clinton Foundation received $2.3 million in donations from Ian Telfer, Telfer, a mining executive who's also chairman of Uranium One when Rosatom acquired it. It received... Uh, the Clinton Foundation, $31.3 million and a pledge for $100 million more from Frank Guistra, the Canadian mining financier whose company merged with Uranium One. Now, I dare the left to compare these facts 
to the snipe hunt that's underway involving President Trump or any of his satellites. And I looked at the the anti-Trump Washington Post timeline for Donald Trump, and it's crazy. They, They say there's so many twists and turns in the story involving President Trump and his team and Russian meddling in the 2016 elections, and they don't give you a single twist and turn that has a fact. Not one. They can't put Donald Trump with any executive that bought anything, that negotiated anything, and they want you to believe he's guilty. He won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show.